So welcome to the second episode of the All Things Interesting podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. William Rasman. He is a renowned hair transplant surgeon who has an interesting history across not only surgery, but as an entrepreneur, he has spent time in the military and has had various experiences across multiple ventures, as well as created multiple patents. Hi, Dr. Rasman. How are you today? My pleasure to speak with you. I'm fine. Thank you. Great to have you. Now, it's funny because I spend quite a bit of time on Reddit. I'll work the website and I'll go under different subreddits. And I found myself under the Tressless subreddit. I'm not sure what the uh, the name stands for exactly, but uh, people on there will kind of talk about hair loss. That's it. it. It is a big topic to talk about. A lot of people lose their hair across their lifespan, more so later in life. But when I was lurking on the website, I noticed that Dr. Rassman would come up under the comments section. Now, how did you find yourself under Reddit? It, it seems like a community... Uh, based off people just asking questions and talking to each other. But for being a renowned surgeon, how did you find yourself on Reddit? I stumbled into it uh, one day. Uh, Somebody had sent me a question. I have a site called Balding Blog, which I've had since 2005. And I've answered about 14,000 questions on that site. And it's become a major reference site on Google. So if you ask a question about hair... Somebody has asked me that over the past uh, 14 years, and uh, I've answered questions on it. So so that reference has caused uh, some notoriety for me in terms of an authoritative source for answering questions on hair loss. So people from Reddit started to write to me, and that's what brought me to the Tressler site. And then I decided just to participate because the audience on Reddit is different than the audience on most of the other sites that I've seen. It's a younger group, uh, a group that is more naive. Uh, Many of them are in the early part of their hair loss process and uh, panicking. And so I thought it'd be like a fatherly figure for many of these people. Now, do you think the panic is warranted? I mean, it seems as though everybody goes through hair loss at some point in a time granted you know there are exceptions due to genetic qualities in that respect some people will lose hair uh, by a certain age others may have a full head of hair even into their 50s or 60s so do you think the naivety and the panic is justified or is it worthwhile noting well to answer that let's step back for a moment half of the male population will develop some degree of balding and half will not so uh, my great grand, my grandfather, for example, on my mother's side, died at 102, and he still had the hairline he had when he was five years old, with all the hair that he had when he was five. So, so we see people, and by the way, uh, many of his sons were in the same category. So there are some families in which there is no balding at all, and uh, no expression of the balding gene. So that's half the population. So now you take the other half uh, in which uh, that population will start balding, of which most of those people will develop significant balding before they're 30, many before they're 26. And particularly the people with very advanced forms of balding will all appear early in their early 20s and mid 20s because the most of the very balding patients that I see are fairly bald by the time they're 26, 27 years old, who have advanced balding. So if you're, I remember, uh, I, I like to go use stories as examples of things. And I think this, I can give you a very interesting story uh, to help illuminate your question. I remember a, a 21 year old man that came in to see me with his dad and his father was very bald and the young man was starting to, to recede and, and he came to see me about his hair loss and brought his father with him, something I generally encourage. And the father was silent through the entire interview and the entire examination. And then I explained to the young man that he was too young to do a hair transplant 
Best off to go on medications and wait until the, the balding pattern became apparent. But looking at his dad, I said, it's highly likely from what I see that you're going to develop a pattern similar to your father. And the young man says, I really don't want to look like my dad. And at that point, his father, for the first time, spoke up. And he says, damn it. He says, it was good enough for my father. It's good enough for me. It should be damn good enough for you. Which, which, which points out an important, maybe generational gap, that maybe back in the time when his father was balding, there wasn't really anything out. You didn't have finasteride. You didn't have minoxidil. You had no way to slow it down or treat it. Uh, the transplants in the 1970s and 80s were deforming, so that wasn't really a good option. So, so many of these uh, men just accepted their balding. Most, most people did. Um, in, in the new generation, we are more take charge of ourselves and our future. And with better technologies, better medicines, better surgeries, we can literally control our appearance with regard to, to balding, if we wish. And it's possible for a man who is developing significant balding to keep his hair through his entire life with a good plan and a good doctor. And I think that's what's important here. Uh, and, and I think the Reddit young men are like, uh, to some degree, like that young man that, that I was talking about who, who wanted to take charge uh, but didn't quite get the support from his dad. So many of the Reddit uh, men who reach out may have it, be finding, having difficulty finding some place to reach out to get information. And the Reddit Tressler site becomes that source for them. Mm -hmm. So do you think there might be more of a societal pressure to prevent hair loss or to seek out hair transplants? I mean, if we look back at the 50s, 60s, 70s, people weren't as interconnected as they were. We didn't have the societal pressures via movies and film, radio, anything of that nature as we do today. People have access to Facebook, Instagram. Uh, they're always trying to get the, be the newest things, the best things. So do you think there's more of a pressure on the younger generation these days to pursue hair transplants to make sure that they look their best well, I think else. I think there's a series of answers to that question. First of all, the technology has improved dramatically. In 2002, when I published the first uh, article and introduced what we call FUE, which is a, the minimally invasive hair transplant surgery, uh, at that moment was a turning point, and the world uh, immediately uh, started. Uh, doctors from all around the world started doing it, and patients from all over, young men from all over the world became aware of it very quickly and uh, uh, started demanding it. And it took quite a few years before doctors developed enough sophistication to do it well. But that minimally invasive surgery means that a person can get a hair transplant and never go bald if they are losing their hair. And, and I've done this on many patients where I've picked them up at a, at a reasonable age, uh, built a plan, and as they balded, uh, kept up with their balding with hair transplants and kept uh, them hairy for their whole life. I have men now in their mid-50s that fall into that category that I've treated for 30, almost 30 years like that, and they all look great. Mm -hmm. So hair transplants are, or at least FUE and FUT, are relatively new as far as procedures go. But for those who don't know much about hair transplants, can you provide us an in-depth breakdown of what a hair transplant entails and then what exactly are FUT and FUE? Okay, um, first of all, men develop what they call pattern balding. This is half the population. And it means by a pattern balding is that they develop some type of pattern in their, in their balding. Some people just lose hair in the front. Mm -hmm. Some people just lose hair in the front and the back of the head with hair remaining in the middle. Uh, 
some people uh, just lose all of their hair on the uh, front, top, and back of their head. So uh, the but but one thing that's characteristic of a hundred percent of these men is they never lose the wreath of hair that that runs around the head. It 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 goes from the the front of the temples around the side of the head above the ears for a, a height of about three inches all the way around the back of the head. This wreath of hair is always present 100% of the time. So for whatever reason, uh, we don't lose that hair. Uh, back in 1959, a guy, a doctor named Orentrig recognized that the hair back there in the back of the head and the side of the head, uh, low down on the side of the head above the ears, had a special genetic uh, quality to it that uh, didn't get impacted by the hormones that produce ge genetic balding. And he found out that if you move that hair any place, if you move that hair to the front of the head, it would always grow and take its genetics with it. I always tell my patients from a joke point of view, if I put one of those hairs on the end of your nose, you'd have a ponytail <laughs> on the end of your nose. Uh, it doesn't remember that it's been moved. It just keeps growing. That's all it knows how to do. So the, so the doctors learned that the key to transplants was to move it from the back and side of the head to the places where the balding appears. Back in, in 1959 through 1990, roughly, uh, the techniques were gross. I mean, they were awful. Uh, doctors used drills, hollow drills, the size of a pencil. They would, they would drill out pencil-sized plugs, stick them as cornrows in the front of the head, and people would have a cornrow on the head, and those were called plugs, and of course, everybody saw them. Uh, I'll, I'll digress for a moment to tell an interesting story about Frank Sinatra, who back in 1980s went to see a doctor in Beverly Hills for a hair transplant, and he had these plugs put on his head. And when he saw them grow, he was so angry, so angry, he wanted to I won't tell you what he wanted to do to the doctor. <laughs> Use your own imagination. I don't want to uh, malign him at all. But he was depressed. And as a result of that, uh, he put on a wig. And he wore a wig for his entire life. So the hair you see on Frank Sinatra is a wig. Mm -hmm. And he would never let those plugs show. Uh, I did a surgery on Andy Williams. I don't know if you remember him. He was one of the great crooners in the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s. Uh, had many shows in Las Vegas. And I did his hair transplant in early 1990s. And he told me one day that uh, Frank Sinatra and he ha was having dinner. It was the night before he was going to have a transplant with me. And when Sinatra found out that he was going to have a hair transplant, Sinatra went completely berserk. He said he never saw for Sinatra lose his cool, completely lose his cool. And as a result of that, um, uh, he realized uh, the trauma that Sinatra underwent uh, for that hair transplant. As a side note, the doctor, who had no scruples and no ethics, uh, publicized all over Beverly Hills and all over California that he did Frank Sinatra's hair transplant. And when people looked at Frank Sinatra with the wig, they thought that was his hair transplant. And this man absolutely made a fortune, made millions and millions of dollars off the reputation of mutilating Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and that's quite more common than people think. There seems to be a lot of snake salesmen, so to speak, when it comes to hair transplant surgeons, at least as I've seen based off some of the posts on the internet and Reddit. I think, I think that's true. I think the, the, it's like a, a, a barrel of apples. You get some rotten apples in the barrel. Amongst doctors, you get some rotten apples amongst the doctors. And you get some doctors that don't have ethics. And uh, I've always taken very strong stands against those doctors. And I've been chastised by my strong stands. I've been very public about my stands against them. I have volunteered to be an expert witness in court against these doctors, and uh, that didn't go over well for a long time within the medical com uh, hair transplant community because they felt that it was breaking the brotherhood of doctors that you would testify against another doctor. But to me, if a doctor is a slime, slimy guy 
and does damage to people, then those people should be able to sue the doctor, and I'd be very happy to help them. So going back to hair transplants, I think we were talking specifically about what the different procedures okay. were exactly. Yes. So there, there are two types of surgeries. To get the hair out of the back of the head, you can cut it out with a scalpel, sew it up. That's called a strip surgery. It's, it's called FUT, but that's, that shouldn't be called FUT. I call it a strip surgery. You take a strip of, of scalp out, you sew it up so nobody could see that the strip has been removed. You cut it up under a high-powered microscope with a team of people, and then you place them in, in small needle holes in a pattern and distribution in the balding area that reflects the way God would have had your hair growing. So there's an art form on how you do this, and, and uh, I help define that art form. When it comes to removing the hair from the back of the head, are you essentially decreasing the height, so to speak, of the back of the scalp and placing it on the top of the scalp in rows? In, in a strip surgery, if you take out, let's say, a half an inch strip high, out of the three inch area of permanent zone that would take it from three inches to two and a half inches. In theory, you would say, well, now it's only two and a half inches high, but that's not what happens. Uh, over the next few months after the surgery, it's still three inches high. So if it's three inches high and it was three and you took out a half an inch and it didn't change its height, that means that the density of the hair reduced by one sixth. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. Um, the, the hair in the back of the head then stretches to accommodate it. Now, let me switch to the other technique called FUE, which is the other technique that I pretty much pioneered. I figured out you could take them out instead of with a knife, you could take them out with a small punch uh, that measures maybe 0.9 millimeters, really small. And you align the punch and you take them out one hair group at a time. Hair grows in groups of one, two, three, and four hairs each. We call these follicular units. And God made it that way, so you should put them in that way when you, when you do it. So if you take it out, you can uh, take them out in groups of one, two, three, and four hair gr groups. And then uh, by, by plucking them, you're know, cutting them and plucking them out of the back of the head, now you have these very tiny holes in the back of the head. So instead of reduce the, the, the back of the head area by a half an inch like you do with a strip, you're, you're taking out little tiny holes of, of, um, of skin with hair in it, and um, uh, that gives a very different type of distribution in the back of the head. When you take out too many, then you get into problems. Uh, you can take out three or four thousand graphs, in other words, three or four thousand, one, two, three or four hair groups on most people and do it well without looking bald in the back of the head. If you take out more than that, some people will start getting bald in the back of the head, so you'll be switching balding from the front to the back, and that's not a very good exchange. So you mentioned three to four thousand FEU groups. What does that specifically mean when someone gives a number such as three to 4,000, how many hair, hairs are, is that? Okay, the, the total human head contains about, for a Caucasian male, and each race is different, but let's talk about Caucasians. And for simplicity, I'm gonna round it to 100,000 hairs. So a typical average human male head has 100,000 hairs in the hair bearing area of the scalp. That wreath around the side and the back of the head has about 20% of that volume. So there are about 20,000 hairs in the back of the head. And the follicular units, these follicular groups of one, two, three, and four hairs in a Caucasian male, and it's different in different races again, average two hairs per follicular unit. So that means that there are 10,000 follicular units in the back of the head. Now, I hope I haven't lost anybody in the math. It's pretty simple from here mm -hmm. on, okay? If there are 10,000 follicular units, we call the follicular unit a graft. So that's an interchangeable term. So if I took out 10, uh, 
3,000 follicular units out of the back of the head, I will have reduced the volume of follicular units by 30% if they're 10,000. If I take out 6,000, I would have reduced it by 60%. The limit for FUE is something between three and 6,000 follicular units, depending on other factors. So, so uh, you have to be careful that you don't turn balding the back of the head into a bald area as well. So that's why you need a surgeon who knows what he's doing. Does that help explain it? Yeah, that does uh, provide a good explanation. Now, the question from there is, how many hairs are on the top of one's head? And could someone effectively go from being completely bald on the top of their head to having a full head of hair strictly from transplant methods such as those? Well, think about, uh, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Uh, since you're only going to be removing half of of the 20% of the hair in the back of the head, or a little over half of the, let's use the word half, of the 20%, you're only moving 10% of the hair in the back of the head to cover an area that's 80% of the hair, then you have a uh, 8 to 1 ratio, which is not great. So the most hair you can get uh, out of the back of the head is not ever what you had at the beginning. But there was a very interesting study, and this is important I, for me to digress for a second because it answers your question. Uh, Dr. Merritt in Denver, Colorado, did a study back in the 1980s where he took a guy with black hair and white skin who had a medium weight hair. So he was kind of a typical average black haired guy. And he plucked out, he got, he got him to volunteer to have half the hairs out of one side of his head plucked out. And then he got a photographer in to photograph the two sides. And he brought experts in to see if they could tell which side was plucked. He didn't tell them which side was plucked. And nobody could tell which side was plucked. So we know right away that a person can have the look of fullness with half the hair missing in a black-haired, white-skinned individual without telling that it's reduced. Now, obviously, in a black on white, which is like newspaper print, when you get more than half of the hair removed, at some point, you start seeing the thinning and you start seeing the balding. It turns out that if you have brown hair and a tan skin, you, you can get away with even less hair. And if you are blonde with blonde hair or, or white skin with white hair, you could probably put back 10 or 20% of the original hair and it looks like you never lost a hair on your head. So there's a color contrast issue that dictates the look of fullness that, that is not necessarily co comparable between different color hairs from one person to the other. So a person with black hair and white skin will be, more, will be much more easily detectable for hair loss than a person with blonde hair and blonde skin. The typical, typical blonde could lose 80% of his hair before anybody would know he's losing it. But if a black-haired, white-haired, white-skinned individual lost 80% of his hair, he'd look terrible. So here's a question from that. Going back to earlier in our conversation, uh, we were talking about how some individuals are more predisposed to lose their hair at a younger age than others. But has there been much study into examining their backgrounds in relation to that? So in other words... Have they looked into studying the color of their skin relative to the color of their hair next to their ages to see if maybe people who are not losing their hair at a later age are more or less white, fair skinned and have blonde hair? Is that something that's been looked into? No, I just think that what, what happens is that the, the higher contrast between hair and skin color, in other words, the black... The, the, the black hair and white skin guy, he picks up his balding earlier than the blonde would. Okay, uh, if a guy has very dark skin and 
African American, for example, with black hair or brown and or brown hair and black or brown skin, that's just like the blonde. In other words, that's the same color contrast as as a a blonde skinned blonde hair individual. It's very low, so those people could lose a lot of hair before it's picked up. It just happens to be that the people with dark hair and light skin are the guys that are picking it up early and panic early. But I don't think there's any connection between uh, the appearance of balding and their age. So and, has there been... Oh, go ahead. And, and there's no connection between that and the color of their hair. Have there been any r- research or studies into more of the geographical locations of some individuals? So whether you're Caucasian whether you're European in terms of descent or Asian in terms of descent, has there been much study into the genetic predisposition to go bald uh, it, based off region? Well, since we, we seem to have all come out of Africa, and uh, we can basically say that all the studies of all the races have shown that the, that the genetic, the incidence of genetic balding is the same, regardless of your race. So uh, the Chinese, the Korean, the Japanese, the Indian uh, of India, the people from South Asia, the people from uh, the Middle East. Now that group that I just mentioned happened to have different hair counts on their head than the Northern Europeans for some reason. For example, that group that I just mentioned have about 80,000 hairs on their head on average, while the Caucasian Europeans have about 100,000 hairs on their head. And if you go back to the Africans, the Africans have about 60,000 hairs on their head. So there's a big difference between the different races in terms of the hair counts, but not the incidence of balding. That goes straight across. Now, there is one exception to that rule. There is one race that I didn't mention that is unique and has no genetic balding, and that's the American Indian that arrived out of the Alaskan bridge. In other words, there are two groups of American Indians. There are the American Indians that came up from South America. Those Indians have the same genetic balding as everybody else. But the Indians that derive from the Alaskan bridge and from the Eskimos, those Indians have zero genetic balding in their their family line. So it's postulated that um, 2,000 years ago or whatever it was, when they came across the Alaskan Bridge and made their way into North America, there may have been some ethnic cleansing of the balding gene in those Indians for superstitious reasons that wiped out the genetic balding within those Indians. And that's the only explanation you can come up with as to why the American Indian that arrive from that derive from that uh, ethnic background have zero genetic balding. Mm-hmm. Now, I kind of want to come back to this topic at a later point, uh, but on the topic of the fact that they don't have ge- the genetic predisposition to bald, my understanding about balding is that in some ways it is caused by the amount of DHT in the hair follicles, which in turn minimize the width of each hair follicle. Would that be correct? Not exactly. What happens is you first have to have the genes for balding. So if you inherited the gene for balding uh, and you're in that group of people, then uh, the presence of DHT will trigger at a particular age in your life, uh, the genetic balding process. Now, we, we have something called biological clocks in our body. And the hair follicles that are, that are uh, destined to be lost from genetic balding have a biological clock. And it basically tells you how many hair cycles they will have before the hormone DHT will activate the gene to cause the hair to die. The death of the hair is called apoptosis. So let's assume that you have a three-year hair cycle. In other words, it goes 
for, uh, from growth to sleep and then growth to sleep and cycles every three years like that because that's what normally happens on a human head. Um, and let's say it's three years just to keep it simple. If you had seven hair cycles in the front of your head, at which time uh, the, the, your biological clock gets triggered by your DHT, then at the age of 21, seven hair cycles from birth, uh, you will start losing those hairs. And uh, there's nothing you could do about it, but you could stop it with drugs like finasteride, which block the DHT, so you can slow down the trigger that basically causes the apoptosis. Mm -hmm. So are there any other causes of balding, uh, not only on a genetic factor, but outside of DHT as well, that we are not aware of currently? For 99% of men, young men with balding, it is all genetic. There are other diseases that cause uh, balding that are, uh, you know, we're replete with different diseases that do that, autoimmune diseases of different side types, infectious diseases, fungal infections, things like that can cause balding. But, but uh, for most of the young men on Reddit, uh, these people have somebody in their family that they've inherited the gene from, and they are coming to that age where their biological clock is, is going off and starting the balding problem. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, D, or not DHT, but finasteride seems to be the most talked about treatment for this. So for those who don't know, what is finasteride as a treatment? Finasteride, it, it was interestingly uh, uh, discovered uh, back in the 1980s, I believe, when a group of uh, uh, researchers went to the Amazon rainforest and they found a, a group of natives there that had no balding and uh, had uh, no prostate cancer. And uh, they looked at their diets and they found them eating a tubor which was unique to that rainforest. And when they took the two bore back to the lab, they found a drug much like finasteride. So these people were uh, taking finasteride uh, in their diet. Now, as a side issue, there was a very high incidence of hermaphrodites amongst those uh, natives. In other words, many of the native uh, children were born uh, uh, middle sex. They, didn't, they weren't either male or female. They didn't develop penises or testicles or true vaginas. They had some mixture of the two, and it was very common amongst them. So they saw right away, and it was the incidence of the hermaphrodites that really triggered their interest in the drug. And the, the side interest of no prostate cancer and no balding uh, was apparent after they studied the hermaphrodites. So that's part of the reason why uh, in all the warnings that you read now on finasteride, they warn you not to let a woman go near the drug, touch the drug, um, uh, handle it, take it. Uh, if she's uh, go potentially pregnant, she could potentially cause trouble for her child, unborn child. Wow. I, I remember hearing stories of how doctors would provide that explicit warning, but I never understood the pure background as to what the effects could have been for a woman taking a drug such as that. And you see a lot of warnings uh, provided for finasteride in terms of side effects, uh, at least on the sexual end of it, whether it be uh, prevention of sexual function, uh, amongst other things. But it's crazy to see how many side effects could occur, not only from a male taking it, but if a woman even if she's pregnant, is exposed to that drug. Finasteride has many other side effects. Uh, like any drug, uh, there's not a drug in our in our in what doctors prescribe that doesn't have some known side effect. Um, the the uh, most common side effect is a watery semen, which is present easily in more than twenty five percent of all the men taking finasteride. The semen change is its consistency with orgasm to be much more watery and sometimes less in volume. It doesn't mean that the men are not capable of impregnating women. So I always tell the men just to still think that they're as uh, capable of making somebody pregnant with or without the drug, despite the change in their semen. 
the, the other uh, side effect that everybody talks about is the sexual side effects uh, and the sexual side effect that comes under uh, great scrutiny is the decreased sex drive and the, the erectile dysfunction that occurs in about 2% of the men that get it. Um, the, there is a um, uh, probably a, a similar increased sex drive that is not reported, and I've been getting a lot of reports on Reddit and elsewhere <laughs> lately about people had how to handle their increased sex drive since they went on finasteride. My son, one of my sons who took the drug, uh, found his sex drive was completely almost unmanageable, uh, and his girlfriend was very happy. It's funny you say that, though, because while following that subreddit, you would see a post every other day with people providing fear-mongering reports of sexual dysfunction side effects caused by finasteride. Do not take this drug because of X, Y, and Z side effects. Do you think those side effect claims are kind of overblown? Is it basically a small minority of people who are perpetuating this fear, possibly? Well, well th there's a huge audience on Reddit. And let's, let's assume that the incidence of side effects, true side effects, not the nocebo and placebo effects, but just the true side effects is 2%. So that means out of every 100 readers, if every 100 people taking finasteride on Reddit, two out of the 100 are going to have sexual side effects. And of course, they're going to be the vocal ones. The other 98 won't talk about it. So, so it's very easy to see why more people talk about the sexual side effects on Reddit uh, than people who say, I don't have them. Uh, you will see sometimes comments on Reddit that I don't have any sexual side effects. So uh, I think it goes both ways. But I think, uh, the, uh, I always tell a man, a young man, if I give a man, let's say, who's 20 years old, finasteride and prescribe it in my office and during a consultation, I tell him, let me tell you, if I, if I was to tell you, you breathe the air in my office and that will produce impotence, you won't get an erection tonight. And, and sure as hell, that will happen. So young men are very suggestible. So a young man who reads about uh, sexual side effects will psych himself up to getting them and he'll get them just from the psychology uh, because of the the hype on, on, on the uh, young men that, that sometimes uh, get exposed to all this negativity. So I, I think there is a very high uh, nocebo effect on the uh, Reddit readers, readers, and we may see a disproportionate complaint on the incidence of ED and decreased libido amongst the Reddit users because it self-feeds. It's a cycling uh, process. Mm -hmm. And that's highly overlooked uh, in any case, uh, because I see it as mind over matter. Like you mentioned, people tend to psych themselves out when they hear reports that negatively associate something with what they're doing. So if someone consistently hears on a forum that a drug causes negative side effects, it will perpetuate the idea that if they take that certain drug, for example, they themselves are going to be affected by that side effect. And it, it seems overbearing uh, to see on such forums. But that said, from your research or research that you've read, do you think there are long-term negative implications of taking a drug such as finasteride? Um, th there's a condition uh, that is discussed uh, in great controversy called post-finasteride syndrome. And these are men that have been on the drug, uh, that stop the drug, and they can't get an erection, and they lose their sex drive forever, supposedly, whatever that means. Um, I can tell you the following. I probably prescribed 20,000 prescriptions, given 20,000 prescriptions for finasteride, and a number of my colleagues who are in the same category as myself in terms of numbers, I bet you we have well over 100,000 prescriptions uh, written. And we've all gotten together to compare the incidence of post finasteride syndrome amongst our group of 100,000 patients, and it's essentially zero. So now what does that tell us? Well, 
there may be something different about the way we practice. And there is, clearly. For example, uh, let's take you, and let's assume you came to me and you had erectile dysfunction and it really bothered you. I might try to reduce the dose uh, that you take and see if that works to, to, to obviate it. But if it doesn't work, I would eventually tell you to stop taking the medicine because it's probably not worth losing your sex life in exchange for your hair. It's not a good exchange. And I'll leave that decision to you. Many doctors don't do that and many patients don't do that. So the, there's a suggestion from our group of 100,000 prescription writers, if you will, that, that, that the, if there is something called post-finasteride syndrome, and, we'll, and I'll talk to you why there may not be, um, it, it may be related to people who've been on the drug with a significant erectile dysfunction and loss of libido for over a year, and it may have done, enough, done something to the central nervous system, the sex drive there uh, to have caused this. Now, I want to point out some other interesting findings. For example, they've done studies in Japan and one Scandinavian country where they looked for post-finasteride syndrome and they didn't see it amongst that population. And despite the fact that there were tens of thousands of men on finasteride. So what's different from Japan and maybe Scandinavia compared to the United States? Well, there's a very big difference when it comes to the litigious nature of our society. There's a class, class action suit brought on uh, by uh, Americans, many Americans, against Merck for their loss of their sex life. And everybody's hopped on the bandwagon. So there's a financial incentive for very many men to claim that they, that they are sexually impotent, whether they are or not, and there's no way you could tell. So uh, the, the lawsuit has thousands of men involved in the class action suit. In Japan and in Scandinavia, that doesn't exist. So there's a question of whether the incentive to hop on a bandwagon to try to make money has been distorting the incidence of post-finasteride syndrome or the existence of post-finasteride syndrome at all. And that's one of the discussions today. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's research that weighs more so in one side than the other when it comes to a lawsuit such as this? Because like you said, in Japan, it's not as prevalent to see any cases of this, but in the aforementioned country, you said there's a lawsuit pertaining to the use of finasteride in regards to sexual dysfunction. So do you think that there may be a viable case or is this something you would see that would be thrown out of court? Well, there, there, some of these cases have gone to court and have been thrown out. So I, I'm not one to judge one way or the other. I have a really, uh, I'm not, I, I've read most, many of these articles written by all sides and I don't think I've seen anything convincing one way or the other to say yes or no on the, on the subject. I'm just going to sit back and be an observer. Mm -hmm. So if we kind of roll back just a bit on finasteride, it seems to be, from what I've read at least, a very crucial construct uh, during the time of puberty. But after the fact, as you get older, is there much of an effect of taking finasteride on hormones? Is it something that can negatively or positively affect a man or woman? Well, first of all, one of the things that we must take note is that uh, is the incidence of erectile dysfunction in the population based upon age. Did you know, for example, that 20% of men in their 20s have erectile dysfunction, 30% of men in their 30s have it, 40% of men in their 40s, 50% of men in their 50s, 60% of men in their 60s, and so on. So, so what we find out is erectile dysfunction is a product of aging. And uh, uh, now if you are 30 years old and you take finasteride and you're one of those people that have been developing slowly erectile dysfunction and now notice it more than ever and you continue to take finasteride, now you have something to blame that it's the finasteride that's causing my penis not to work anymore and it's not, it's not me. It couldn't be me because I'm as young and vital and and, and sex-driven as anybody. 
So I think it becomes difficult to tell. We do change with age. Our hormones all across our body is changing as we get older. Uh, something that uh, a 20 year old doesn't want to know from a 30 year old barely understands it. When you get to 40, you start saying, Oh yeah, I start seeing it. I have a few sons in their forties and they're complaining to me about a whole bunch of things going wrong with their body already. So I'm pointing out that we all see age affecting us in many ways. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's take for example, or let's give them the benefit of the doubt for a second here. Let's say that side effects do occur. If someone comes to you and says, I want to reduce side effects, would you simply recommend to reduce the dose? Because my understanding on that is finasteride has a half-life of seven hours, and people typically recommend taking one milligram per day in general cases. Do you think reducing dosages to maybe once every other day or reducing the actual milligrams taken would be of positive effect, but still provide you the capabilities of the drug itself? Okay, let me elaborate. Uh, first of all, the blood life of the half life and the bloodstream of finasteride is not relevant. What is relevant is the tissue life of finasteride in the hair follicle and throughout your body. The tissue life of finasteride may be in terms of weeks, not hours. So you take a pill of finasteride and it's out of your body in 24 hours, no, no, no trace in your bloodstream. But the effect on your hormones and uh, elsewhere is still there and will last maybe weeks after you take that pill. So if you stop it today, you won't have clearance of the finasteride from your body probably for a month or two at the most to, before you start seeing all the effects that you, that you wanted to get rid of gone. So, so most people, so when, you, when I talk about reducing dose, which I do often, for example, a one milligram pill, pill is considered ideal. If you take a half a milligram, half the regular dose, it's 80% as effective as a full dose. But the effects of that reduction might take a month before you see the effect because of the tissue life of the drug. So the reduction down to a, to a half dose, you should wait a month before you see that it's any better. And then if you want to go down to a quarter of a dose, which is 50% as effective, you still have to wait another month to see the effects of it. So it's not like, a, like waiting it for, to clear your bloodstream. It's really a tissue effect. Uh, and, and most people are not aware of that. Hmm. Seems like one of the most common misconceptions about the drug that it does still sustain its effect in the body much longer than people normally anticipate. Uh, that said, though, there, there are other remedies to hair loss, other treatments available. One of them that you mentioned before was minoxidil, uh, or in other words, on its commercial name, uh, Rogaine. Uh, what can you tell me about that? Well, minoxidil was discovered in the 1960s in Minnesota, where I happen to have done my internship. So I know the people who discovered it. It was an anti-hypertensive medicine. It was a pretty bad one. It was totally uh, incapable of controlling blood pressure. It was very erratic in different individuals, and they eventually pulled it from the market. But what they did note is that the people who were taking it, the women that were taking it, started to develop facial hair and body hair. And they started to realize that there was an interesting side effect of the oral minoxidil on hair. So as a result of that, uh, they, they uh, started to play around with topical minoxidil. And that's where Rogaine came from. It's a, it's a topical uh, preparation uh, for the same drug that was used for blood pressure taken orally. Now, in, in countries like India, uh, many doctors prescribe the oral minoxidil for the treatment of hair loss. And in many parts of the United States, doctors are now starting to do that when people are not getting response. But oral minoxidil in any reasonable dose, high dose, puts you at risk of some cardiac complications. There are some severe cardiac complications, other complications from the oral pill. So you got to be careful when you take it, that's all. 
So you how need... does it act differently than a drug, say, like finasteride? What is what are its properties or the application well, that differs? Finasteride works directly on the hair follicle blocking the DHT. Minoxidil induces hair growth in places where hair growth doesn't exist. So uh, if you put minoxidil on the back of your of your hand, for example, you may grow hair on the back of your hand. And, and uh, unfortunately, minoxidil is not 100% predictable. I would say about 30% of people who use minoxidil get reasonable results. The other 70% get mild or just little fine, soft, bellus hairs, not really very strong hair growth. Now, one of the things I read about minoxidil is that once you're on the drug, you're basically on it for life. If you stop taking the drug, you will lose all of the hair that you potentially could have regrown from it. Isn't that kind of a dangerous side effect considering the other possible complications that could occur uh, on a cardiac level? Well, well, let's talk about both minoxidil and finasteride in terms of withdrawal. <clears throat> if you had, if you put hair, a minoxidil on the back of your hand and you grew hair and then you took away the minoxidil, the hair that you grew on the back of your hand would go away. That's what happens every place in the body where you grow hair from the minoxidil. But if you put minoxidil on a normal head of hair you and then withdraw it after a year, you'll have no effect. So minoxidil doesn't have withdrawal on a normal head of hair. doesn't have any effect. It only affects those hairs that were induced by minoxidil. Finasteride is the same thing. When you go on finasteride and you stop it, let's say you've been on it for 10 or 20 years, and then you say, look, I'm not losing hair anymore, uh, and I'm going to stop my finasteride, and I've seen many men do this. Uh, then they get 20 years worth of hair loss occur in, in six months. Uh, all the hair loss they would have had in the past 20 years just hits them in six months. And they're, they're, they're a disaster when they come and see me at, at that point. Is that stuff reversible, for example? So say if someone was on minoxidil, for a six month to one year period, they stop taking it, all of a sudden it reverses and they lose six months of hair. If they were to theoretically go back onto the drug again, would their hair regrowth reverse back to what their initial growth was or will it lessen? So it, to might, speak? it might, uh, that may happen. I, I, I can't tell you for sure. I, I can tell you that the finasteride never quite comes back to the same level because what happens on that biological clock that starts kicking, uh, if, you, if you've been on it for 20 years and you lost the hair that you would have lost 20 years ago, that guy may not come back. But the hair you lost five years ago may come back on the finasteride when you go back on it. So you may not get all the hairs back uh, that you lost when you stopped the finasteride. So I tell the men that have been on finasteride for a long time not to go off of it and to stay on it. There's a good, there's a good side effect, by the way, um, to staying on finasteride because it's anti-cancer of the prostate. So how effective is finasteride? So say someone has some moderate level of thinning on the scalp, uh, whether it be at the front of the head or on the crown of the head, how effective is finasteride in inducing regrowth back to, say, a full head of hair where there's perceived thickness? It's not 100% predictable, there are some general rules I can come up with. I can tell you that the younger you are when you start it, the more effective the drug is. It's more effective when it catches the hair loss early as opposed to when you catch it late. Um, uh, so if you're 19 years old and you're starting to lose hair and you go on finasteride, you have a greater chance of reversal than if you are 40 years old and you've been losing hair for 20 years, and then you go on finasteride, I wouldn't expect a big response. Now, with that said, I have a, had a 70-year-old friend who comes to me with hair on his head. He says to me, Bill, he says, look at this. And he points <laughs> to his hair on his head. And I smile. I said, well, that's new hair. I hadn't seen that before. He says, well, I've been taking Proscoff of my prostate, and all this hair grew on my head. I said, well, congratulations. So... So the, the rule that I just told you obviously is broken periodically. Mm -hmm. 
So it could be a case by case basis, That's dependent right. on an individual, basically. Yeah, I can't uh, tell you where you would fit fit in that spectrum. So, for people who are prospectives in terms of taking finasteride, what would you say the general turnaround time for regrowth would be? Because I'm surfing Reddit and I read a lot of these posts, people asking, "Well, I've been on." finished finasteride for six months eight months haven't seen any regrowth my hair has gotten more and more thin over time is there a general process or phased approach when taking a drug such as that i think you stay on it if you don't get side effects and you can handle the medicine you stay on it at least a year or two you'll see the it'll peak out at two years uh and you shouldn't be in any rush so is it act differently so to speak and compared to minoxidil from what I've heard minoxidil changes the life cycle of a hair so it speeds up the growth phase goes into the resting phase and then goes back into the growing phase again whereas finasteride basically reduces the exposure to the follicles by DHT so does it spur regrowth differently in a sense I think that, yeah, there's a difference between the two drugs, but but uh, uh, finasteride attacks the the hairs that are miniaturizing, that are being impacted by the genetic process. Uh, minoxidil does not. It, it's more generalized. So uh, it's a different, uh, it's a different response. Also, uh, uh, if finasteride reverses the miniaturization process or regrows hair, that has a that that had just been lost. Uh, it, it it could be very dramatic. You you occasionally see the drama with um, with uh, minoxidil more in the crown than elsewhere. I don't see that great results in the front as I do in the back of the head with uh, with minoxidil. So does finasteride on that note? Does that impact one part of the hair more so than others when it comes to? potential regrowth i think yes i think the 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 uh, uh people with recession uh rarely see a reversal of the hair loss from uh finasteride uh, people who are miniaturizing might see it reverse in the front uh, in the crown we get a lot of miniaturization so we get a lot of reversal on the finasteride so one of the interesting things i've noticed that while searching reddit people per fried some form of treatment which would be something called the big three and in essence it's a combination of the drug finasteride minoxidil and i believe a shampoo called ketonazil i'm not sure what the exact correct pronunciation of it was but people find great value in combining the three as they have some form of synergetic effect do you think that is the best course of action for somebody who is faced with thinning or balding I think uh, open up all the guns and and do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's fine. But nonetheless, I kind of wanted to move into some of the questions that were posed on Reddit. I, prior to this conversation, actually went on to the forum and wanted to get the feedback from the community as well to see what are some of the most common questions that they have uh, in related to hair loss and balding that they're hoping that you could provide some answers for. So with that said, let's just jump into some of these quick fire questions and see what your thoughts are on them. Okay. So the first question would be, what are your thoughts on the drug Dudasterid? And is there a reason you do not see it as something worth prescribing to patients? Uh, Dutasteride has, uh, uh, both Dutasteride and Finasteride are what they call competitive inhibitors. In other words, they compete with the enzyme 5-alpha reductase at the hair follicle level uh, in in the action of DHT. Uh, Finasteride is about 70% as effective at at that competitive inhibition. Dutasteride is about 80 to 85% effective at that. So in effect, uh, dutasteride is slightly more effective than finasteride. Uh, but if you have a person who's a non-responder for finasteride, they will probably not respond to dutasteride either. And, and uh, the only times that I basically would prescribe 
dutasteride, uh, which is off-label, which means it's not FDA approved for hair loss, so I have to go outside of, uh, if you will, my standard of practice uh, would be on a person that was getting effective uh, effects of finasteride and losing the effect, then I might try uh, dutasteride on that patient. Mm -hmm. So the second question I have is what treatments look the most promising to you? So in other words, are there any studies or research being done into treatments that could pose a greater positive effect than what we currently have available to us? Are you talking about things that are new that have never mm -hmm. been released? Yeah, so yeah, so basically, are there any treatments that haven't been released yet that have a great deal of poten potential? Well, I don't talk about it very often. I could talk a little bit about it here. Um, yes, there, there is a treatment that I may have uh, shortly. Uh, I haven't decided how to use it uh, because it's not been approved yet by, by uh, any agency, and I have to do it under my license, uh, which I'm allowed to do. Uh, uh, we found out that... Uh, if you go back and you find, a, you ever see a person with a black mole on their face or on their body and, and they have hair growing out of that black mole, mm -hmm. okay? And, yep. and it's hair just like you have on your head. So they call these things hairy nevuses. So a researcher who's absolutely brilliant um, went into human, got human tissue samples and isolated... Uh, it took a, quite a few years to do it, isolated, you know, about a hundred proteins that were unique to that mole. And maybe one of them would be the cause of the hair growth. And he did isolate one or a group that caused the hair growth. And he put those in mice and we did uh, skin transplants from facelift patients. And uh, uh, some of my plastic surgery friends don donated uh, skin from many of their patients and we put those that skin on mice and then we trans we, we injected that skin with um with uh with the with these this quote protein cure and lo and behold we got uh hair <laughs> so uh, would the hair be much uh more dense than yes, you just, see just, a mole like that? it's just like the hair on your head Wow, no kidding. I mean, you would think that if you see a mole like that on somebody's face, there'd be like a, a single hair or two at most that's growing out of it. But you're saying with the process that you're working on, you would see the density be much greater than it would be otherwise? Well, we, we haven't done it on humans yet, and this has only been done on mice. So I have uh, lined up a series of human volunteers. Everybody has begged to be in the study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like a fascinating uh, research study to conduct, especially when there's still a lot of uncertainty with what the future holds well, in terms of there, treatments. There, there are a whole bunch of things we don't know uh, in humans. For example, let's take a guy who's very bald, and he's been bald for 40 years. He lost his hair at, at the age of 22, and he's now 62. Let's make it up, Okay. And he's slick bald from front to back, excepting for that wreath of hair we were talking about. The question we ask, are all the hairs that are not there now still there? Are they just lying there as dormant stem cells that are waiting to receive the protein that they're missing in the genetic process? And if they got the protein, will they start up and grow again? So that will be an interesting study. I have uh, a billionaire friend of mine, <laughs> who made me swear he'll be the first guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Well, and and part of his head has that type of hair, no hair, and part of his head has still residual hair that is going out and has been hanging on by a limb for, for years. So I'm going to treat him in both areas to see if the, I, I can resurrect the dead and if I could take the hairs that have been hanging on and turn them into normal hairs again. Well, that's going to be awesome to see. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, though, uh, based off my research, is that mice tend to react differently than a human would react to certain drugs. So, for example, you might see a lot more hair growth, uh, but some drugs 
with mice than you would on humans. Why is that, in your opinion? Well, there's a difference. The mice mo model doesn't work well in, in a human condition because it's a different model, the human. But here we're talking about a human extracted protein that, that is used in mice to induce hair loss. So since it's already derived from a human, mm -hmm. and now we're producing it human protein, there's, we have every reason to believe it'll do the same thing in a human that it does in a mouse because it originated in the human. So this is a very different uh, approach. Uh, all I can tell you is a published a paper will be shortly published on the subject in probably the most prestigious journal in the world. And the editor of the journal said it was the most unique approach to hair loss he's ever seen. Well, it's definitely exciting to hear. You would uh, definitely be something to watch out for when that post does show up because there's still a lot of uncertainty amongst the community. So to see the possibility for a treatment such as that to come out, that that's quite positive to see. Uh, moving by, on to by the, the way, what I, I just told you, I, I have not really told that to anybody in a public, <laughs> in a public area. Uh -huh. And I can't tell you to keep it secret because I've already put it on the podcast. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are going to hear this. But, but, don't, I'm but sure I don't they're... want everybody on Reddit to write to me and says, please include me in your study. So I'm going to warn everybody ahead of time that that uh, the only way you can get in the study is you've got to visit me and I have to basically uh, bond with you. And uh, I have a limited number of people because the protein costs a fortune and I'm paying for it. So, so for all you listeners out there, there's your disclaimer prior to I think Bill Rasmus' study. Which, what you want to do for all the listeners out there, stay posted with me, and either on Reddit or on Balding Blog, I will announce it when it's available as a drug for everybody else. But I think it'll take about six years. Well, definitely exciting stuff. I will be sure to be looking out for that as much as the community will as well. Going on to the next question. How would you compare the effectiveness of topical finasteride with oral finasteride, and how do the possible side effects differ from one another? There's a lot of controversy on that. Um, uh, it's everything is, is compared against the oral as a standard. So uh, the question comes up: Does the topical finasteride equal the oral without syst enough systemic absorption? to cause any of the side effects that everybody's concerned about. And there seems to be an indication that that does happen, that you can get a similar response uh, from the topical uh, as you can from the oral without the systemic absorption. So for those men that have sexual side effects, that 2% we were talking about, they may be reasonable candidates for the topical. We are combining topical finasteride with minoxidil to try to make it more effective. Uh, the Italian doctor that I posted about, which I did post up on Reddit and also put up on Balding Blog, uh, uh, reported uh, uh, 77 patients or thereabouts with outstanding results and not a single case of sexual side effects. So when you say combining both minoxidil and finasteride, are you referring to basically inducing or combining the actual dose of finasteride into the minoxidil solution so they don't have to take an oral finasteride pill on top of applying minoxidil to the head? Is that yeah, yes, it, it, but it, you'd have to apply it to the local area. The, the problem I have with, with topical finasteride is if you take an oral finasteride, it affects all the hair on your head. But if you're going to put on topical finasteride, and let's assume you're only going to use it in the front and on the crown, uh, it's expensive, and, and you're only going to get, in theory, the results on the front and on the crown, not anyplace else, where you may be losing hair and just don't see it. Um, if you apply it, say, all right, well, I'm going to use the topical and apply it every place, well, then it's going to raise your cost up significantly, and you may find that the systemic absorption will be very high. So you may end up with the same sexual side effects that you would have before just from taking the oral pill. Hmm. That's interesting to know. So going on to one of the less talked about 
topics or questions here, and I, I'm actually curious myself about this, but female hair, lo hair, hair loss doesn't seem to be talked about as often, but is still common among some women. Is this something you personally deal with? And if so, what are some of the most effective treatments available? Yes. Well, first of all, there are a series of uh, issues. 50% uh, of all the men in the world will get hair loss. 50% of all the women in the world will get hair loss. The difference, however, is that the, most of the women who get hair loss, not all, but most, get the hair loss when they go through menopause because the estrogens created by their ovaries, which supports the hair against their own internal testosterone, is lost when the ovaries stop working. So then the effects of their own internal testosterone take over, kicks the genes in, and then they get some hair thinning. The female, because they don't have the proportion of... Um, the proportion of uh, uh, the amount of hormone that the male does doesn't ever get, rarely gets the type of pattern balding that the male does. So with women, it's more generalized thinning that we see. Uh, one of the common things that I'm doing a lot of, and it probably represents 20% of my surgical practice, is lowering the hairlines on women with far, big foreheads. And that seems to be a very popular uh, surgical procedure now that's taking off. And that is, a, uh, we're getting very great personal satisfaction out of that. So Mem what does it mean to exactly lower the hairlines on a person's scalp? It, it means bringing the hairline forward by an inch or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, there's a lot greater improvement for women when you do that. Yes. But it, it, are there any other, say, solutions or treatments that are similar to uh, minoxidil that would be effective for a woman? We, we know that finasteride isn't something that a woman could take due to the hormonal challenges with it. But are there anything that's available? Is there anything that's available that isn't surgically based? Yes, a combination of both. First of all, minoxidil might work on women, and I generally recommend it for women. And for postmenopausal women, when you know you're not going to have babies, uh, about half of the women will get some response from finasteride. Because uh, remember I told you the estrogens which protected their hair against the DHT attack from their own internal testosterone can be blocked by finasteride. So in some women, they'll get an effective block and it will reverse or at least slow down the, the thinning process. Hmm. And again, this is post-menopause. That's right. These are, these are women after menopause. You don't want to put it on a woman who can get pregnant because then you've got big troubles. This is an interesting question, and I can't say I've heard of one of the two drugs, but are you familiar with RU58841 or the drug Brizula? I've, I've read about them. I'm not blown away by them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they do offer based off the studies provided so far on them? Or for those who are listening, what exactly do they do? It's not in the mainstream, so I haven't really focused on it. What are your thoughts on evidence-based medicine versus relying on your clinical experience, or in other words, personal anecdotes with respect to your field? Well, I'm a, a firm believer in clinical trials. I like to see uh, uh, good uh, research, uh, clinical research on anything I do. Uh, I rely heavily on my own personal experience because I've been doing this for 28 years, almost 29 years now, and, and uh, uh, I have a huge amount of experience in the field. Uh, many people from all over the world uh, write to me many times, doctors, to ask me my opinions on different subjects. So I, my experience really does help. Mm -hmm. So another question I'm sure we've kind of touched on before, but I'll go ahead and ask it again because it does also have a sub question associated with it. But one of the most common observations with those who take finasteride is shedding. In your experience, is shedding common and to be expected while on the drug? And if so, what causes these periods of shedding? 
And then the sub question we can touch on after is can Finn asteroid cause telogen effluvium due to hormone changes? I I have not seen much shedding on the patients I prescribed finasteride, so I don't echo what uh, many of the Reddit uh, uh, people are talking about. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, since 99% of the men that have uh, hair loss or a thinning in males is genetic and cause, I don't really see much telogen effluvium. I'm having my own difficulties in recognizing telogen effluvium in men. I see it in women. Uh, I think the women is w women are a different beast, so to speak, and I don't mean that uh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here, here's a funny question, and it kind of goes back to our discussion on hair transplants, but bear with me here. When an individual reaches a Norwood 7 on the Norwood scale, and maybe you can also touch on the different levels on that scale as well, but would it be possible to transplant the majority of your donor hair to the top and then use body hair to fill in the donor area on the back of the scalp? Well, let me back off for one second. First of all, body hair is not... I don't like body hair for, a, for, the, for the reason that... If you take body, let's say you, my, I have a lot of chest hair and let's assume I was going to use that hair. The hair growth cycle on my chest hair is about a six month antigen cycle and then it falls out and then kicks in again three months later. So for every 10 hairs I move from the body, uh, about half of the guy is growing at any one time. So if you put up a thousand graphs of body hair, you get 500 working guys for a thousand hair work and a thousand hair investment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Not a good exchange. So it's just not viable. It's not a good, I don't, even though some people do it and they are desperate for it, I think you can get almost all the hair you need on almost everybody between the hair on the head the beard under the chin and scalp micropigmentation in combination to make anybody look hairy. Hmm. Okay. So next question is, what is your take on the current state of stem cell technology and whether you think stem cell treatments will be feasible and affordable in the foreseeable future? I don't see stem cells, uh, s there have been no, well, let me back off. Uh, Jehoda back in 1988 successfully cloned a hair uh, from his wife to his leg, or it was the other way around, I don't remember. Uh, and and uh, that's the only time it was ever done. Uh, many doctors in the early 1990s, uh, researchers were able to successfully clone hair in a Petri dish. Then they put the hair that they cloned in the Petri dish and they put them in mice and all the mice died. So with 100% death rate, <laughs> why did they die? The hair grew in all different directions. They had bacteria in the hair follicle and they got septicemia and they died from massive infection. So the problem with, with, with cloned hair is you can't control direction. And that's a big problem if you can produce a cloned hair. How do you guarantee the orientation so the hair knows which way to grow? And that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And nobody has solved that problem. So I so don't... That's basically, that's basically the biggest challenge prevalent yeah. when it comes to some cells, aside from the death rate that's we, theoretically possible. Yeah, we haven't really been able to target... Uh, the growth of a hair follicle from stem cells. So, mm -hmm. But we have uh, been successful at, at getting cardiac muscle and cartilage from stem cells, but for some reason the hair follicle is more resistant. I think, I think it's got something to do with the fact is that, is that many of these things like heart cells, the heart muscle is, from, is, is a mesodermal cell. Uh, the cart cartilage is an ectodermal cell. The hair follicle is an organ that contains all three cell types. <laughs> it's an unusual, and every single hair follicle is a complete organ system. 
So uh, that makes it much more difficult. So the hair follicle is a bigger challenge. Definitely something that's a long way off, even if it could be perceived as a viable solution decades from now. So at this point in time, we're probably stuck with general surgical methods as well as some oral and topical solutions. That said, though, the next question we have is, has there been much research into the long-term aesthetic effect of hair transplants later in life when hair tends to thin out more? In other words, does the transplant begin to look unnatural at that point? Not if you have a good doctor, uh, because I've done people 29 years ago that still look great. Now, I've only been doing this 29 years, so, uh, but I've got as much experience as almost anybody practicing today. And yes, the hair thins out, but if you do it normally, you just thin out like you would normally. No big deal. So I kind of want to stick on this topic for a, a minute here to provide the audience with a bit more background and information on a surgical method. So when someone's determining whether or not they want to get a hair transplant, so to speak, what are some things they should be looking for? In other words, what doctors would be the best for providing these, whether they be people you know, regions, so to speak, and what would be a typical cost for a hair transplant? I know you've mentioned that there are different types of hair transplants and different degrees, but what is the typical associated cost with those as well? Hair transplants are expensive like any cosmetic surgery. Um, uh, it depends on how bald you are. Uh, if you just have corner recession and a little frontal recession, uh, it might be able to be done for a six or under ten thousand dollars for the whole thing. Uh, if you're very bald, it'll obviously take more. You pay by the quantity, the amount of work, if you will. Uh, and each doctor puts in a different amount of work uh, on each different patient, depending on how much hair he has to move. So everything is uh, tied to the quantity of hair moved. Uh, a long time ago, uh, I, I came up with the idea of hair for life for a patient. So I made a guy a deal. He paid me $20,000 and I guaranteed him that I would do hair for the rest of his life for whatever he wanted. I was curious how long it, what, what the impact would be on, be on me financially, whether I would make money or lose money on the man. So if he had one surgery, I think he had 2,200 grafts. Uh, that might have cost him about $12,000 had he bought it on the market at the time. He had another surgery after that for about, of about 1,600 grafts. That might have cost him another $9,000 on the market. So that brought him up to the money he paid me. He came in a third time and he had 700 grafts because that was all he had left. So after that, he said, you know, I think I'm happy. And obviously, since you're not getting any more grafts because I'm out of hair, I'm going to stop doing surgeries. So I ended up about breaking even on that man in terms of what my cost would have been. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, should I do that again? Should I make a, an insurance policy and offer it as hair for life for, for patients? Maybe, maybe sometime down the future, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an interesting business model, nonetheless. Uh, but a follow-up question to this is, when should somebody who's interested in getting a hair transplant, what age should they look to do so? Is there more or less a borderline age someone should consider looking into one versus not? Yes. Uh, generally speaking, and I'm talking as a rule, 25 years old is the cutoff. Uh, and the main reason for that is, is the balding in a male um, really declares itself by the time you're 25. So I want to know what the future holds for you. And it's really important uh, in, in, in building a master plan for, for the patient. Who's, and I can't do it at the age of 20 because at 20, I can't see the balding. So if I start transplanting him at 20, then he'll lose more hair at 21. I'll have another one. At 22, he'll have a third transplant. By 23, he'll have a fourth transplant. At 24, he'll have a fifth transplant. By the time he's 26, he's out of hair, and he keeps balding, and he's stuck 
with not enough hair to to cover the balding pattern. So, yeah, so basically you're gonna you're gonna result with a messed up scalp, so to speak, if you don't wait for your full head of hair to form its specific shape, so to speak, by a certain age. Because I know we mentioned before that there's different Norwood levels and people bald in kind of a horseshoe pattern. But if they don't wait until that kind of sets itself, they're going to deal with kind of a deformity, so to speak, with how the transplants grow out. Yeah, there's also issues of maturity and financial ability to handle the problems. I may change my rules because the, uh, the use of the hair check instrument has changed my ability to predict. So many times at the age of 22 or 23 years old, if there's significant balding that's affecting somebody's social life, and I got a hair check on him and I followed him over a year and used medicines and see he's non-responding to medicines uh, at 23 and he's mature, and understands what he's getting into, and he figured out the finances involved with it, I might transplant him earlier than 25 years old. But that's that's a bonding issue. Uh, that's, that's a doctor-patient relationship issue. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that you just pointed out was the hair check tool. What is that exactly for those who don't know? It, 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 if you go on boldingblog.com uh, boldingblog on the very top of my video choices is a video on on how the hair check instrument works um the the it, it's an instrument that measures hair bulk uh so uh what we do is we gather up uh, uh let's say a square inch of hair in different parts of the head and then squeeze it together to measure the bulk of the hair with a special instrument that that has a recording device on it so by, by doing this in different parts of the scalp, you can actually determine the actual bulk. So for example, let's assume uh, I saw you, you had a little frontal balding, that's all you had. And I did a hair check machine on you and, and I found out that you lost a third of the hair in the back of the head and a third of the hair on the top of your head. And yet you're saying to me, I don't believe it because I look perfectly fine. Well, remember I told you earlier, if we go back to the earlier part of our conversation about the black-haired, white-haired guy, white-skinned guy, you know, he could lose half his hair and not see it. So you may not see your balding, and yet you may be balding. So hair check tells me what you can't see and what I can't see either. So that gives me a, a metric, a number that will allow me to make a decision about where you are in your balding process and be able to follow your balding and the effectiveness of treatment beyond what you can see. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a big one on this instrument. Now, one of the common things to see is that one moment someone has a full head of hair and not three to six months later, their hair is either bald to a degree or they're facing some extreme form of thinning. Is it that thinning and balding occur at a rapid pace or is it because like you said earlier that the volume of the hair decreases over time and that you won't see necessary thinning until they see 50 percent of their hair gone that's right you might you might not see the 50 percent mark but you might see it at 60 percent so all of a sudden you go from 50 to 60 percent 60 percent in a year and you make a phone call and say doctor i lost all my hair in the past year but in fact, I'll bet you it's been going on for years and it's been going from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50. <laughs> and that, is, that is crazy to think about, though. I mean, if, so, if someone walks in your office and they lose 50% of their hair already, is that something that a drug such as finasteride could reverse at that point in time? It, is it too late? It's possible, particularly in the young man, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy to see because a lot of younger generations are starting to see themselves bald by the age of 18, 19, 20, and they've either lost half their hair or they have the typical Norwood 7 pattern. And by that point in time, they think to themselves, well, I lost all my hair, time to go completely bald. But it, it's good to hear that, you know, if they start taking something such as finasteride or even minoxidil, that they could potentially reverse that to some degree or to a high degree uh, based off some of the examples or case-by-case -case basis I've seen on Reddit, which is it's fascinating to see some of the reverses you see from someone going completely bald 
to having a full head of hair after a year by combining those three drugs, so to speak. Moving on to the last few questions here. In younger individuals taking finasteride, can facial hair development become inhibited? We haven't seen it. So it's not something that you would see as being reduced or prevented by taking finasteride. Yes, I've not seen it. Is gray hair caused by finasteride? And I'm kind of hesitant to ask this question because, at least from my experience, gray hair can be a cause by an assortment of reasons, uh, mainly due to stress and cortisol levels. But you might have a, a, a more defined uh, opinion on that matter. I don't know. I don't believe it is directly caused. But as you point out, uh, the appearance of gray hair is a, is multifactorial, and it's possible finasteride could be a contributing piece of it. So there you have it. Those are some interesting questions that were posed on the Reddit. But before we close, I kind of wanted to touch on part of your history that we haven't had a chance to look at early in our conversation. And one of the most interesting things that stuck out from you based off the keynote speech I watched prior to our conversation and something that I noted on your biography is a motto that you live by. And that is, there is always a better way to do it. What does that mean to you exactly? I, I, I think you should never be accepting of the status quo. Uh, we are put on this world to make a difference. And I think that uh, everything that you do should be looked at uh, uh, carefully and uh, whether you're doing it the best way possible. You know, we all develop insights in what we do. We become experts in what we do. We should think a little bit out of the box sometimes and saying, do I have to do it this way? Is there a better way to do it? And I'm constantly always thinking about better ways of doing everything I do. I have three patents submitted now that are, that are going through the patent attorney. I have 50 patents already issued. Uh, I constantly am thinking about better ways of doing everything I do. Uh, it doesn't make a difference what it's related to because my patents have covered everything from medical devices, heart pumps, uh, computer software, exercise equipment, uh, biotechnology, hair transplants, you name it, uh, uh, the hair transplant robots. Uh, I have two patents on that. Uh, I mean, I'm just constantly looking for things, that the ways of making things better and making it better for everybody. And it's just my nature. Uh, well, it's obviously fascinating to see that you live and stay true to the motto that you tend to say. And it's even posed in the reward that you received in 2003 called the Golden Follicle Award. And the fact that you're, you were named the most outstanding hair transplant surgeon worldwide by the International Society for Hair Transplant Surgeons. So it's awesome to see that you stay true to your word and that you've had such a unique and fruitful history in not only your specific profession, but the work that you've done outside the profession. And, and that's part of the reason. And that's part of the reason why I, I've made a dent in the hair transplant business. Because when I entered this business, the standards were terrible, and I just said, "Hey, this is an easy field to change, and it could be better." And there's got to be a better way. And I figured out a new technology on the first day I did the surgery. My first patient had an operation nobody ever did in the world before I did. Uh, I was gutsy to try it. It worked <laughs> on the first patient. He was very grateful. I improved upon that and over the years kept improving upon it and coming up with better technologies. And I pretty much led the world in the field because of that. I've constantly improved what I've done, changed what I've done, uh, made it better and better and better. And that's my life is uh, just changing things and making it better. Now, your biography showed that you began as a cardiovascular fellow in heart surgery. Now, is the reason you transitioned over to hair transplant surgery 
as a major practice of yours because you found it to be something that lacked progression. It lacked standards and it lacked any stability. Is that is that one of the main reasons why you decided to pursue it and to put all your effort into making it something great? Well, that's not at all the case. Uh, I, I uh, uh, left cardiac surgery um, because I felt that there was too much politics and publishing and it was boring stuff. It was at that time mostly revascularization and uh, it was kind of a repetitive, boring surgery. Uh, so I decided I didn't want to do that and I left the field and uh, went into general surgery eventually, which was much more diverse. Uh, I could do heart surgery, lung surgery, bowel surgery, ENT, gynecology, orthopedics. I was trained in all these fields and I did all of them in a small town and uh, it, was, it was very challenging, but I got bored again, even with all the diversity. I own, opened up a dairy farm, uh, bought a dairy farm and my wife and I uh, milked 150 cows. She did the milking. I ran my surgical practice and then I shut my practice down for um, uh, two weeks every time the crops had to come in when I was out there on the tractors bringing in the corn and the alfalfa. Um, then I left the field of uh, medicine completely in 1983 and, and entered the windmill business. And if you look outside of Palm Springs, you'll see a, the, a, lots of wind farms all over the place. And I put up a quarter of a billion dollars of those windmills, formed my own company and made a lot of money, sold the company. That was my first fortune that I made. And that had nothing to do with medicine. Then I went into... Uh, uh, Computers, uh, worked with Control Data Corporation on artificial intelligence, worked at the uh, only hospital in the world, had an AI-based medical uh, computer system, learned all about AI, gave a critique of that for the president of, a, of Control Data Corporation, which at that time was the number two computer company in the world. Um, then I decided to form my own computer software company and built that, uh, automated the medical record, uh, took all the money I made in my previous ventures, dumped it into that. Uh, Wall Street loved me. I was a little favored on Wall Street. And then in 1988, there was a big crash on the stock market just as I was raising my last round of funding. And I don't know if anybody knows anything about funding raising, but when the stock market crashes, everybody runs. And all my investors left me with, with a lot of debt and, and, and a big payroll that I couldn't meet. I had to close down my computer company and it was a disaster. It was my first depressed period in life where I had to go out and figure out what I was going to do. And uh, I found the hair transplant field at the time, and that's what I entered. So uh, I uh, did very well in the hair transplant field, was immediately successful. Uh, I was probably noted, noted within the first year as probably the finest surgeon in the world, doing the finest work in the world. And this was in 1992, pretty much. And my practice grew huge. I mean, I had eight doctors working for me. I had uh, operating rooms going all the time. The patients were lined up six, eight months in advance waiting for appointments. They were flying in from all over the world to see me because I was the only one doing this type of surgery. And uh, so I made a fair amount of money uh, running a, a big clinic. And then uh, I got a little bit uh, uh, disoriented again and uh, uh, dissatisfied looking for a new challenge and my patent attorney from, from who did many of my patents came to me in 19, in 2001 and he says, Bill, he says, I got some, a company here that's got 33 technologies. Why don't you come take a look and see if you want one of them? And I went over to that company and um, uh, I looked at the 33 technologies and evaluated them, found one, figured out it was a lab on a chip, bought the technology built a company. Once again, I took all the money I made, dumped it into that company, and uh, uh, with $11.5 million invested, I came up with a lab on a chip, literally uh, to replace the hospital laboratory with a credit card. And I'm now in the process of building it and raising another round of funding uh, to finish that project. So that's another thing I do on the side. Uh, so it's just some of the things that are exciting about my life hope I stimulated a few people who are listening in the audience. 
Well, it's definitely an understatement that you seem to be not only a true entrepreneur, but a jack of all trades and master of all. You've had quite the lucrative and prestigious career in all things you've done. Uh, And I'm sure that I speak for the audience as well to say that we're very excited to see what comes of your current study and potential treatment not only in the hair transplant industry, but also on your side businesses as well. So with that said, I I really appreciate you taking the time today, Dr. Raspin, to speak to me. You have an incredible career, and I'll definitely, amongst the rest of the community as well, be looking forward to your upcoming research study. Thank you again. It was a pleasure, really, to talk with you today. And and it was an easy conversation. And I hope uh, nobody got bothered by by my Brooklyn twang, (laughs) which comes out during these long long conversations. (laughs) Yep, definitely some fascinating stuff. And it's been an absolute pleasure with this conversation. So again, thank you. All right, thank you so much.